Hi everyone, hey, thanks so much for joining me today. Hey, I wanted to let you know something, especially to those of you who are a part of the Hillside family, uh, about an announcement I made this morning. After almost 35 years of ministry at Hillside, um, I'm going to pass the baton to someone else. Um, my last Sunday at Hillside is going to be June 23rd. And we're gonna begin a process of seeking God's direction for the next person to come. And But I wanna let, wanted to let you know that. I will continue posting messages as long as I can um, through this whole process, but I wanted to let you know, especially again, those of you who are part of the Hillside family, that my last day at Hillside will be June 23rd. Well, today, we are continuing our series in the Bible book of Ephesians, and this message fell at a perfect time. You know, the, I made the announcement at church, and it was, you know, you could see people were visibly a little bit saddened, a little bit upset, but the message is about how we are to be united. Now, I don't mean to be uniform. God doesn't want us to be all the same, you know, cookie cutter. We're all made different, and God can use those differences for us to unite together and do great things for Him. And so today's message is called, United We Walk. We first of all have been looking at some doctrine, and some of you may have felt like, wow, chapters one and two and three, they seem really heavy with doctrine. And Paul purposefully does that. He gave that as, you know, here's some truths that you need to know in your life. So that's, that's the no part, you know, the doctrine of Ephesians. And then there's also been some things, some life-changing principles that we saw. We saw some last week. Um, Jason has shared some. And we, we, those are really the areas where we need to grow where some spiritual growth needs to happen. And we've learned, you know, how we're adopted into God's family. We've learned about how we this hope that we have in our inheritance, that God's promised that we also saw that Christ is our, is our risen Savior and He's now King of kings and Lord of lords at the right hand of God. I mean, all these really amazing truths that God extended His, His amazing grace, not just to Jewish people, to Gentiles, to everybody, and we can all be reconciled and we're all reconciled to God the same way. I mean, all these wonderful things. The, this unity... We can, how we also can experience this unity as God's family as we live in the Lord's incomparable love. Remember last week we talked about how deep and wide, just amazing love that God has given to us. But now in chapter 4, it's a transition. We come to a hinge point where we tra transition our focus on how to live. And we're going to talk about some great stuff. We're going to talk about family, relationships, all kinds of things. But we come to this point and we're talking about how to live. We've been talking a kind of theological truth, but now Paul calls on his readers to respond. So we've had the know and the grow, and now it's time to show it. And here we go. So the rest of this is going to be really on practical things on how to live. But first of all, he wants to get, kind of hone us in on, on some of these things that we need to believe and that we need to understand, but then also need to live out. So we come to the show letter. Let's read this section, and then we'll talk about it today, and then we'll learn some, uh, some ways in which we can, we can live this in our lives. Ephesians 4, 4 verse 1, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given to the measure of Christ's gift. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers 
to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of Him who is the head, that is, Christ. From Him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Let's just pray for a moment, shall we? Lord, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your word that gives us guidance. What a pattern this is, Father, for what you want your church, your family to look like as we flesh this out in a local setting. Help us, Lord, to, to be a part of this body that we can do our part. Help us to, and keep us from thinking that, oh, our part's insignificant. We know, Lord, that all working together glorifies you, brings praise to your name. Guide us as we look at, this, at your word today. And we're so thankful for it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll remember the very first phrase of Ephesians 3, Paul says that he's a prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. And then here in, in, in chapter 4, we just read, he says, he says, as a prisoner for the Lord. So he's a prisoner of Christ, and he's a prisoner for Christ. And, and Paul didn't see himself as a prisoner of Caesar. You know, he's in Rome, and he's a, you know, Caesar is arrested. He doesn't consider himself arrested by anybody other than Jesus. <laughs> the, Jesus stopped him and said, hey, here's what I've got for you. So he considered himself, you know, a prisoner of the Lord, for the Lord, and not in a, anything but a wonderful sense. Um, but he did that. He knew that he was kind of paying the price for being willing to share the gospel, to share the message of Jesus with Gentiles. And so it really confused. I think, you know, the, you think of the Roman Empire, they thought, oh, as long as you Jews just talk about your little religious stuff, that's fine. But now, Rome felt like now you're encroaching on our territory. Now you're bringing this Jesus stuff into our, you know, realm. And that didn't go over so well. So Caesar was going to, you know, arrest him, had him tried. Paul obviously behaved himself because history kind of records that he was able to have kind of free reign over the palace and walk around and then at night was chained. But he starts off by saying, since I've given my life to help you, I want to urge you to help yourself, to help each other. And the main idea of this whole entire section is unity. It's unity of Christians. And it's very, it's the practical application of what Paul teaches in chapters one through three, uh, this whole idea of unity, that we're to guard this, we're to protect this together, helping each other and preserve that unity of believers. You've probably heard that statement, united we stand. Um, well, that's why I'm calling my message, united we walk. <laughs> because, well, and I'm, I'm calling it that, you know, in, in verse 1, uh, 4-1, it says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you, I strongly exhort you, he's saying, to live a life worthy. And that word, the live a life worthy, is actually, it's, it's the word where we get the word axiom or axis from. It's kind of a mathematical term. And he said, it's kind of like balancing out. He says, you know, you should balance out all these wonderful things I've just shared with you with the way you live. You know, uh, live consistent with how you have been blessed by God. And so he says, you know, worthy of, of that, you know, live in such a way that is balanced of the calling you've received. Some translations, if you've got a Bible open, you may see that it says, walk worthy of the calling. And, and, and it actually means our conduct, it's how we live. Uh, we use this, you know, in, in our English, we use that, you know, just like, hey, you can't just talk the talk, you have to walk the walk, right? Or we talk about our walks of life, right? What we're talking about is living our, our life. And that's what he's talking about, that, that conduct. And, and, and the way of living means, you know, bringing this together with unity, but that, that it isn't simply being united uh, for some social reason. We're to live a life that reflects our calling. So what's, what's our calling? And Paul spells that out in Ephesians 1 through 3. And if you haven't been with us, go back and read that. It's just, he says over and over, just telling all the great blessings we have because we're Christ followers. But he said, we've been called by God who initiated the plan of salvation. And then he says, we're called by Christ who carried out the whole thing. You know, carried out this by coming. And then it says we've been called by the Holy Spirit 
who, who seals us and brings us apart and who inspired and enabled this, this whole plan. And so he's called us, he's saved us, he's made us a part of his family. And that's the basis of our walk. That's the basis of our unity. But then Paul shares some characteristics of this unity. Look at in verse 2. He says, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Now, short verse, really packed, right? You say, I wish my family was like this. Well, let's talk about really what this means because we can be unified around this. What we need to do, and I'm going to give you just some steps on us being united, being unified, how to walk in unity. And the, and the first thing we see here is that we need to develop some godly attitudes. Some, and not just the attitude in our mind, but attitude of our, of our actions as well. He, Paul gives four spiritual attitudes that are vital for church unity. Look what he says. The first one he talks about humility. Humility. And the humility is really, I mean, it's more than just the absence of pride. Um, it's not, not a pushy desire to defend our own rights, but sometimes, you know, we think of humility as, oh, we're just lowly and we're, we think we're terrible and all that. That's not. Humility is not seeing ourselves as less important. It's just seeing other people as more important. Um, a lot of people think that humility is putting ourselves down, but it's really not. That's not it at all. Humility is lifting the Lord up. Uh, people talk about being self-reliant, self-dependent. Okay, that's, that's not humility. I'll tell you, being God dependent, that's true humility. When the Lord says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, what is he talking about? Be dependent on him. And that's what real humility is. Um, a prideful person depends on themselves. A hu humble person is a person who depends on the Lord. And then gentleness, gentleness. And that's not talking about, you know, uh, we could say it's the absence of force. But this is, it's also called meekness in the Bible. And many think of meekness as weakness. It's, it's, it's. Its etymology has the idea of strength under control. In fact, it was used to describe horses that were broken. Um, my sister has trained horses. My older sister, she's trained horses. And she's even, when she moved to Washington, she even kind of domesticated some wild horses. And when I say wild, I mean wild, wild horses. You know, not ones that just got out, but horses that were born in the wild and, and survived in the wild. And kind of got them where they follow her around like a dog. It was kind of funny to see pictures of this. But... Um, but, you know, just because a horse is broken, if you're, those of you who have done horse training or whatever, just because a horse is broken doesn't make their, mean they're less strong, right? They're still just as strong as they were before they were broken. But it's that strength under control. And then patience. Patience. Um, that's the absence of, the, of rage and the anger. And, you know, we talk about people being short-tempered or having a short fuse, but we don't really have a good English word for having a long temper or a long fuse. We really don't have a good word for that. But it's, this, is it, this is it. Being patient. That's what we need. This attitude to have to develop toward each other. That adds itself to, to unity. And, and many times we, um, we have to exercise patience because, well, for one, we're human <laughs> and we're going to disappoint ourselves and each other. And, uh, and, and then he says, he uses, this is the word, the word tolerance. Now, I almost hesitate to put that, it's, you know, but this is really the absence of legalism and, and the absence of restrict, restrictive thinking. This word is so highly overused in our day, that, um, but this is, here's what this word means. It's a, it's a Greek word translated bearing with. It means to take, to take responsibility again and again is the idea of this word. The idea is to continually and patiently enduring, tolerating, bearing with one another. Some of you do this with people at work, uh, right? There's just that person who kind of grits on your nerves. The person who's just, you know, and it may, it's not that they're hateful. Maybe it's just their personality kind of rubs you wrong. But you just think, you know what? I'm just going to, I'm just going to be forbearant of them. I'm just going to, you know, they're kind of strange or whatever. Um, and again, if you don't have one of those at work, it might, well, I, it might be you. Um, okay. <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah. We don't have any irritating people in our, in our family because it's me. <laughs> so, um, but see, all of these, these are so important. Now, all of those, God says, are done in love. In love. That's the, the, the it, so that could, we could put that as its own attitude. But look, humility and gentleness and patience and tolerance, all of that done with an attitude of love. And what's love, really? I mean, it's really seeing each other. It's, being, it's the absence of ignoring each other. The reason Christians 
forbear mistreatment by others is their capacity to love. God has given us a very unique capacity to love and to face issues with each other. We may use the term cut, some, cut people some slack. As Christ followers understand, God has given us his love and we have a greater capacity. So when everybody else, I'm using the work analogy, when everybody else is losing their cool because this person's driving them nuts and you seem to be able to handle that, that is the Holy Spirit working in you because the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. And so, so that's vitally important. In verse 3, as we continue on, it says, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Now, I want to see, point out one thing. You notice this? <laughs> Make every effort. That sounds like this is work. And that's number two. Um, determined to work at it. Determined to work at it. Um, this isn't just unity this is unity in the Spirit. This is, this is a unity in the Holy Spirit. I, I coached a soccer team for many years, and um, I remember teams, um, and Stephanie was on a number of them, and well, I coached all three of my girls, but um, Brittany and Stephanie are the longest. But when, and she'll remember, there were times when we had teams that were really unified, um, and it was really cool. I remember teams where they just just tremendous amount of unity, where the girls liked each other, they, they played well together, and it was so much fun. Those ended up usually being our most successful, and by that, you know, winning tournaments or whatever, most successful seasons. But, but unity isn't uniformity. Now, we did wear uniforms, so that kind of breaks that analogy a little bit. But, but even on a sports team, think about it. What you pick, pick your sport, uh, other than tennis, Singles, I guess. But pick your sport. Everybody's got their position. Everybody's got to play their place, right? You know? Um, yeah, it doesn't work for golf either. There's, I guess, a few of those solo sports. But think of, think of it. Football, baseball. Everybody plays their part. You know, since baseball season is going to be starting up here, right? Start, you know, hey, the, you, you never expect a really awesome pitcher to be a really super great hitter, do you? I mean, sometimes it happens. You know? But the truth is, is that, why? Because they have their role. They have their spot. That's what he's saying. Everybody together. And, and he says here a couple of things. He says, first of all, when talking about making this work, first of all, we have to realize that we make the effort. Okay? I mean, this isn't just willpower. I mean, we do this in God's strength, but we have to make the effort. If you have to tell yourself, okay, I'm going to be going to church and I'm going to have to put up with some people that, you know, or I'm going to work or I'm going to school and I'm going to have to be with people. Make that effort. But the Holy Spirit is the one who brings the unity. That's the second point there. The Holy Spirit brings the unity. And he brings that unity, and it's not just unity for unity's sake, because Christ is the source of that peace. He's the source. He says right there. Paul emphasizes that Christ is our peace. We saw that in chapter 2, verse 14 as well, and that he brings that reconciliation. He talks about reconciliation between the Jews and the Gentiles, which was a new thing for them, not so new for us because we've been you know, living with it for 2,000 years. But peace is that fruit of the Spirit. Paul says, and I think it's interesting, he uses the word bond to describe unity. Uh, the word's also used to describe ligaments holding a you know, body together. And um, I think, and it's going to be very applicable in just a moment when we talk about the body of Christ, but um, the church. But the bond signifies this deep connection that we have, a commitment to live in harmony, love, and reconciliation in the body of Christ. Um, it's kind of like you've heard the statement, you know, you can pick your friends, but you're stuck with your, you know, your family, you know, um, we're family, you know, so uh, we might as well learn to love each other because we're going to be together for eternity, <laughs> you know. But no matter what, we are bound together by what? The unity the Holy Spirit brings, by the peace that Christ gives. And look at how valuable this unity is to God. Verse 4 uh, of Ephesians 4. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. There's a word that just keeps popping up over and over again. <laughs> one. He's really emphasizing this. This is just this is a unifying thing. Um, and so I say this because that's a lot of that's a lot to hold on to. Because when we talk about this, you know, oh wow, you know, one body, one spirit, one hope, one love, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Let me encourage you, number three, dedicate yourself to God's truth. Dedicate yourself to God's truth. 
I'm going to uh, throw these up here and just go through these really quickly. But one body. I mean, this is, this is the body of Christ in which each believer is a member. Now, just because you're a member of one body doesn't mean you don't need a part of a local church. I've heard people say, well, I'm a part of the invisible church, you know, the universal church. That doesn't take away the importance of showing up to, for a local expression of that. So, but you guys are already doing that, so you can check that off. Um, right? It's, that is so very, very important for us to fellowship that way. Um, and, and the thing is, the same Holy Spirit indwells every believer. One body, the body of, of Christ. Um, Paul mentions the Holy Spirit many, many times in Ephesians. Then he says, there's one hope of your calling. Believers face all kinds of challenges, and, and we can do that with confidence, not because of our personality, but because of our confidence in God, knowing that our hope is secure. The one hope binds us together as a spiritual family and rises above all of our differences. I deeply feel sorry for people when I ask them, hey, do you know if something were to happen that, you're, you know, that your life were to end, that you'd you know, be in, with God in heaven? Well, I hope so. That's not this kind of hope. This hope is a confidence that we have in God. Um, and our calling points us to heaven where, where our hope finds its ultimate fulfillment. And we have that confident expectation. God keeps his promises, bottom line. A hope that sustains us, unites us, points us toward eternity. And then he says, one Lord. And this, is, of course, is our Lord Jesus Christ who, who died for us, who lives for us. And one day will come for us. And if we serve the same Lord, how can we not walk together in unity? Then one faith. Uh, Christians may differ in some matters of interpretation of church practice or um, and, you know, various things in, in the Bible. But look, all true Christians agree on the faith. And to, to depart from the faith that Christ is the only way, this death, burial, and resurrection, I mean, those foundational, fundamental you know, truths, that, that foundation of our, that, of our faith, that's where we differ. Oh, people differ on things, oh, the end times or spiritual gifts or you know, that version or whatever. Hey, that's all fine. But the faith... That has to be uniform. And he says one baptism. Now, since Paul was here discussing the one body, this baptism is probably the baptism of the Spirit. When the Holy Spirit places the believer into the body of, of Christ at conversion. Um, this isn't some extra experience after conversion. Um, we are commanded to be filled with the Spirit. But in the Scriptures, we are never commanded to be baptized with the Spirit because we've already, that's already happened. Every time it's mentioned, it it's, it's coincides with accepting Christ, becoming a part of, of God's family. Um, one God and Father of all. So again, we're family. We're all children of the same family, loving and serving the same Father. So we ought to be able to walk together in unity. Now, as family, I, I mean, I've been a part of a family one time um, and still am. Uh, and you know what? Sometimes we squabble, you know? People come around and realize that they were wrong, but you know, we squabble sometimes, you know? Um, no, I, why? Because we love each other at a depth, we're familiar with each other at a depth, and yes, we're family, but he says, you are, but we have one God and Father of all, and guess what? He does know everything, and he is the perfect Father that, that we can come to, and he can, you know, solve our issues and help us with our problems. So Paul then moves from what all Christians have in common to how Christians differ from each other, which is, this is really cool. And, and this is what I wanted to encourage you with, especially with regard to my announcement, because it's like, we all need each other. You know, when, when God takes me, you know, to another place, it doesn't mean, and by the way, I'm not, I don't have another pastor in the wing or whatever, you know, I'm just, we're praying, you know, we're, this is a faith thing for us. But all of you are important. Sometimes because the guy who stands up here in the, you know, bright lights, he's, well, he's the most important. Absolutely not. We all work together, um, and Paul moves into that. And so we need to discover the importance of unity in purpose and variety in giftedness. Now, I could talk all day about spiritual gifts. Back that would be probably a really, really great series. Um, but Paul just uses a few illustrations here. He doesn't try to give an exhaustive list. In fact, he really focuses on ones that are in the church to help um, believers to grow. Um, and before we get into the section, let's first of all define what is a spiritual gift? And this is just, um, this is just a conglomeration of, you know, borrowing other people's stuff. Um, but a spiritual gift, it's a supernatural ability 
or skill given by the Holy Spirit, that's key, because spiritual gifts aren't just talents and abilities, okay? This is given by God, given through the Holy Spirit, which enables us to perform a function in the body of Christ with effectiveness and ease. Now, I'm not saying that exercising your, your gift is going to be easy, but it's going to feel and seem much more natural, especially even as observers will look like, wow, he just has an easy time of that. Um, so that's kind of one. You probably have uh, other definitions of that, but it keeps the body healthy. It keeps the body whole, and they bring the body of Christ great joy when they're all working together. The three main passages describing the spiritual gifts, I don't know if I gave this, oh, actually, I put it up here if you want to jot these down, but um, Romans chapter 12, and then 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, uh, yeah, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12 and 14, um, Ephesians 4 just makes this reference, and then 1 Peter 4 also makes a little bit of reference, but, um, but I got to tell you, I don't think that every gift is listed in the scripture. I think every category is listed but I don't think that, um, I think there are some that are under certain categories. I'll give you, I'll give you just one example. Um, I see people with a spiritual gift of praying. Uh, but, you know, we don't see that listed. Or, or leading worship. See, I, I love music. I, lo- I, I love to sing and worship God. But I don't feel like I'm a person who's necessarily gifted. You've, some of you have been in services where you think, wow, that person has a really a gift of, of leading, of worshiping and leading worship. Um, so that may be under the gift of exhortation. I don't know. But I think that there's some of those that um, are like in categories. So I don't think God's intention was to list this big exhaustive list and say, okay, it's got to be one of these. But one of the things that we see about spiritual gifts is, is number one there, every Christian has a gift. Probably more than one. But if you don't have a spiritual gift, the truth is you're not a Christian. Okay, that sounds really harsh. But God, when the, when the Holy Spirit comes to indwell you, he gives you a spiritual gift. Um, now, you may say, I'm not exactly sure what it is. Well, stay tuned. We'll, we'll work on that. But the second thing is, is that the gifts are not the same as the gift of salvation. Um, they're beyond the gift of salvation. He makes reference to the gift of salvation in just a moment. But, but also, and I've really already said this, but the gifts are varied. They're not, they're not the same, and that's purposeful. Some are more public than others, but none are more important than any others. Okay, just because my gift is, shall I say, louder <laughs> than yours, does not make it more important. In fact, in Corinthians, he talks about that. He goes, those, those, those parts of your body that you really don't see, those are really more important in many ways, you know, if you're going to put importance on them. You know, because we have a tendency as human beings to think, well, the person who's most vocal and most easily seen, you know. But then, they're, they're very, but the gifts have the same source of power. They are spiritual gifts. They are given by the Spirit, and we are given the power, the, the Scripture says, the power of the resurrection is what gives us the power to, to utilize these gifts. That's our source of power. So, so. Let's look at what Paul writes here, uh, starting in verse 7. He says, but to each one of us, if you're a believer, if you you can put your name right there, so you can say to me, to David, grace has been given to the measure of Christ's gift. That's singular, the gift, singular. That refers to God's gift of salvation. Jason preached on this. For by grace you are saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone would boast. So that's, that's the gift. Verse 8, this is why it says... And here he quotes Psalm 68, and he applies it in a broader realm. He says, when, when he, Jesus, when he ascended on high, he took captives and gave gifts to his people. And then he even asks, what does he ascended mean, except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. Now, if you think, wow, I do not understand what that is, that's okay. Bible scholars differ uh, on exactly what this means, and this is something that we don't really arm wrestle over. But what we do know is that this is a reference or a, a, a loose use, use of Psalm 68, 18. And, and really, David's speaking to God, and he's saying that God has ascended on high, led captive, uh, captives, and received gifts among men. Um, really what it is back in the Psalms, it's kind of recalling the Hebrew captives out of Egypt and scattered the kings of the earth and, you know, ascended uh, Mount Sinai. When they, you know, when you read the Old Testament, they would have battles, you know, they would take captives sometimes. 
The thing about this reference is that when Jesus takes captives, it's us. It's willing captives. It's grateful captives. It's like, whew, you rescued us. We were captive and now, so that's where, you know, that's where it's different. Jesus came and Paul uses this kind of as an illustration that Jesus ascended on high and he led captivity or captives captive. And that's us. Um, Paul quotes that and then, and then he adds, that, of course, that Jesus gave gifts um, to men. Paul explains that Jesus had first descended, you know, descended at his death and his burial. Um, we see that in Ephesians uh, 4 9 there. And then he then ascended far above all. And by leading captives out of captivity, he demonstrates, you know, that authority over death, over hell, you know, his authority. And he gives gifts. So it's kind of an interesting illustration. And it it, it, is, it isn't the easiest to understand, but he, it might be also that Paul uses the phrase led captivity captive to refer to those who'd already passed away, who had already died and were kind of waiting for Jesus as a sacrifice of forgiveness. Um, some, some think that, you know, but, uh, and I'm not dogmatic on that. That's just, you know, but the text doesn't specify. So as Paul is certainly referencing at least Jesus's death, burial and resurrection. Paul's reminding the readers that, hey, Jesus is qualified to deliver you. He can open up that prison door. He can set you free. You were captive and he's, he's capturing you. And we are happy about that. Um, and again, if, if that's hard to follow, just do some studying on that. It's, it's really interesting. What you, what you will catch is that Jesus gives gifts to his church. And Paul mentions four of them. And look at verse 11. He says, so Christ himself gave the apostles the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. And there, there it is. Apostle means, means one who, who is sent with a purpose. Jesus had many disciples. He, had more, he, more, he didn't have just 12 disciples. He had many disciples. You'll read in other groups. But a disciple was a follower. A disciple was a learner. An apostle was someone who was a divinely appointed representative. Now, in Scripture, the apostle was to be a person who witnessed or was to witness the resurrection of Christ. They were there. You know, they saw Christ. Um, uh, and so, so because of that, let me just say, there are no apostles in the New Testament sense today, okay? There are some churches, there are some cults that say, you know, or the, the apostle, um, in the New Testament sense, because they can't reach the, the criteria. Paul calls himself an apostle out of, out of time because he did meet with Jesus. Jesus did appear to him and was blind because of it, you know, and so he says, I'm kind of the, the, the apostle that's, you know, a little bit off the regular beaten track. And, um, but so that's, that's really important. And, and uh, we also talked about in, in chapter two how the foundation of the church was laid by the prophets and the apostles. And that's the prophets. Most people think that's the people that predict the future. Um, they could do that, God, you know, but their job was basically as a spokesman for God. Now, if God told them about something in the future, then it looks like they're foretelling the future. But sen again, since believers in New Testament times didn't have Bibles, of course, there were times when they were wondering, hey, is this person teaching something that's correct? What does God want us to do? You know, we get up every morning, we read our Bible, or at night we read our Bible, we can get some direction from God. They, they didn't have that. In fact, the New Testament obviously wasn't written yet. So these prophets would come and they would share with them, as representatives of God, what they needed to hear. And then it says evangelists, and these, this is one we're more familiar with. This is actually the only place in the Bible where evangelism is listed as a gift, um, and there are the bearers of good news. They traveled all over. They preached the gospel. We see that in Acts chapter 8. They went all over. And everyone in ministry, I think, you know, we're really instructed, do the work of an evangelist. It doesn't mean that we have the special gift of evangelism, but I think all of us are supposed to let our light shine before men. Um, and again, that doesn't mean that all ministers are evangelists. They, the apostles and the prophets, they laid the foundation of the church and the evangelists built on that by winning the lost to Christ. Pastors and teachers, pastors and teachers, uh, most scholars, most Bible scholars realize it shouldn't probably be pastors and teachers. There probably should be a slash there, a dash there, pastor, teacher, that it's, that it's together, that it's one. Um, most Bible scholars believe that it's really one single gift. And the word pastor means shepherd, shepherd. He, he's, he's responsible for feeding and leading the flock, and he does that mainly through teaching God's word. Um, and I have to tell you, I have to tell you, I absolutely love it. I absolutely love it. I, I, I absolutely, I cannot tell you how much I love it. 
um, many of you would dread getting up here and talking. Um, am I nervous? Yes, every Sunday. After 40 years of preaching, I'm still nervous every single Sunday. Um, but I just love it. I just, I, I really do. And God wants to use you in that thing that you love. When you go, I just sense God's using me when I'm doing this. And um, now, all pastors are supposed to be teachers. Not all teachers are pastors, by the way. Some people have the gift of teaching, but they're not, doesn't mean that they're, they're pastors. But all pastors are, are to be teachers. In, in verse 12, it says, why? To equip his people for works of service. Um, that's also uh, translated in there as, as the saints. To equip his saints for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Well, look at these things, these gifts accomplish um, as we look at this. First of all, I put it this way, spiritual fitness. Um, because the word equip means to bring to a condition of completeness and fitness. Um, and so the purpose of these gifts of leadership is also clear that it's for the benefit of saints. It's for you guys. So if I get up every Sunday and you don't benefit, I'm, I'm letting you down. It's for equipping. Um, that word, the word equipping there is the idea of putting right. Uh, in fact, the, the, word, the word in Greek and other places is used for setting bones. You know, broken bone for setting bone or mending a net. So, you know, that, that, so, and you know, I thought about this, this is more of an, a, an illustration, but I thought, you know, we're all broken and hurting somewhere, aren't we? All of us in our lives, we have something that we're hurting over, but people with these gifts help to produce strength and help, help mend us. And you have people like that, I hope, in your life that just feel like, man, I just feel like I'm more together when I'm with them or when they encourage me. It's an equipping of God's people so they do the real work of ministry. Sometimes, in fact, a newcomer, a newcomer's class will talk about that, that, you know, you're the ministers. You're never, you didn't realize you were in ministry, right? Well, I'm supposed to equip you to help you go out and be in ministry. And you do ministry at work, at home, at, you know, at school. Um, but leaders have that responsibility to, to equip people to serve. Also, it's preparation for service. And I really mentioned that already, um, that it's all of us serving together. You've heard of deacons, perhaps. Um, well, this Greek word is the word diakonos, where we get our word deacon. A deacon, a deacon is just a serving person. Um, but it's a word that means much more than just working. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a ministry word. It means actively serving and done with a willing, voluntary attitude. It's also, as we see these gifts being exercised, it's a, it's, there's evidence of God's presence there. Evidence of God's presence. The word for built up is literally, it's two words put together, house and roof. And we're called the temple of the Holy Spirit in other places in Scripture. Um, in 1 Corinthians, the people were immature. They weren't unified. So Paul reminds them of this. And I put this verse in there in your notes, I believe. But in 1 Corinthians 3, it says, For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. God's building. And there's the picture right there. A purpose for these gifts was for to be a building, so to speak, worthy of God dwelling in. Verse 13, he says, Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. You see what this is? It's not just a oneness. Number four, it's a confident oneness. Confid not in ourselves. Uh, the unity is not just merely a compromise. It's not just, oh, we've got a mediation you know, person. Okay, uh, we'll give and fudge a little bit. Watching the political picture, people trying to come up with, you know, try, bipartisan. You ever heard it's such a crazy, yeah, yeah, like there is such a thing. You know, it, boom, 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 fight, fight, fight. We, oh, compromise, nobody's happy. He's not talking about that. That's not, that's what he's, it's based on our, our essentials. It's based on our faith. It's based on the peace that Christ gives us. And Paul didn't command a structural or organizational unity, but a spiritual unity around a commonality, the commonality of faith. And because of that, these gifts draw us closer to Christ. Number four, there's a, there's a closeness with Christ that comes when, when we're all exercising our gifts. When these gifted officers, and he mentions these four, and they were be, you know, ones that they would be somewhat familiar with in the church, of course. But when they work right, I mean, saints are properly equipped. Christian maturity increases. We draw closer to, the God, to God. See, we go through the Bible, and I give you a lot of Bible every Sunday, but my goal is not for you to simply just learn the Bible. My goal for sharing God's word with you is that you, that you would know and love Jesus Christ better and, and more. 
That's, that's, and more and more each day. That's my ultimate goal. And of course, God's word helps us with that. And Ephesians 4, 14 says, then we will no longer be infants. Now, there's nothing wrong with being a child. We have to, you know, I mean, kids are great. I love kids. I love my grandkids. I love my grandkids a lot. Um, we got funny videos yesterday of uh, my grandkids. Um, Jakey, who's six months old, uh, the doctor said, okay, give him, teach him some new tastes. So my daughter had some avocado and she was tasting. And we, she sent us the video. And you know, you know, the looks on a kid's face the first time they had like solid food. Oh, man, it was awesome. It's priceless. Um, I almost put it, displayed it, and then I thought, I'll spare you. Um, so... <laughs> But um, it's, it's awesome. It made, literally made me laugh. Uh, it was so great. And then the other thing was so funny is, is then we got little videos of little Joy Joy, who's two years old, running around without pants because she's in potty training. And, um, and so, you know, they were just the cutest things. It's, oh, my goodness, we were just loving it. Now, if they happen to be adults, <laughs> so, so don't send me any videos of you, you know, spitting up food and slobbering all over yourself or running around with your pants off, okay? Just, <laughs> just, let's just not do that, okay? With little, it's cute for kids, right? But he says, he goes, yes, we were infants, but let's not be infants forever here, you know? Um, it's, it's funny and cute when they're young and, and they're infants, but I wouldn't want to see that if they were adults. Because here's the truth. It's sad and it's pathetic when we see either people just being immature or people whose physical limitations have brought to the point where it's, they're acting in a sense like a child. You know, that's, that's sad. And Paul's saying, no, 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 not like, not like infants. And he's talking about this spiritually too in our lives. He goes, not tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. And so I just want to give you this point first, and we'll talk about it. Number six is doctrinal discernment. Just discernment about what's really true. Um, I love this nautical picture that he gives here when he talks about the turn to be. It, it, it means to be, you know, wave pitched back and forth to move, to move abruptly here due to the violence of waves. I, I love that picture. And God has given ministry gifts to his church to form a stabilization, to, to give us an anchor. You know, that will, that will keep us from being tossed to and fro, to, like immature, gullible infants, susceptible to, you know, every flashy new human teaching and clever trick of the enemy. Um, you know, we, you can convince little kids of almost anything. Now, why? Because they're immature. They don't know better. But he's saying, no, no, no. And, and I don't even have to tell you, there are so many crazy thoughts, ideas, opinions these days um, and we can avoid being thrashed about and shipwrecked. And there's even some things that sound like Christianity, sound like Bible. They're just twists. And boy, the enemy wants to just mess us up with that. But if we stay plugged in, you know, so that we won't be shipwrecked in our faith like tiny untethered boats, but we stay plugged into the body of Christ, receiving that encouragement, being strengthened. That's why coming is so important. But getting that from fellow servants, the most important thing, I mean, I hope that you appreciate the message, but the most important thing that happens is when we are together. That's what's so valuable. Online people, you hear that? Okay. Um, verse 15 says, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. And that is, I want you to see, there's, there's a balance, truth balanced with love. That's when, when, our, when our gifts are being used. There's a truth balanced with love. And what do I mean by that? A healthy body of believers combines doctrinal soundness with love. I've been in churches where they were doctrinally sound and were so mean, I could, you know, hardly wait to get out. They're just angry and, you know, like, we're right and everybody else is wrong. It's just like, oh my goodness. It's like, it's not that the Bible part you're sharing that's bad. It's just your attitude. And he says, there's a balance there. And it's not enough to merely know the truth. We've got to express that in love. Um, balancing that biblical knowledge. It's great to have biblical knowledge, but biblical knowledge by itself will puff up, Scripture says. But with that genuine care for each other, a healthy spiritual environment. And what it's interesting is, is I, you know, speaking of the truth in love, we a lot of times use that as, as each other, for, you know, for each other. But this is not only how we relate to one another in God's family, but I think it also refers to those people who are trying to deceive. You have people that are, that are feeding you all kinds of garbage throughout the week. The way you handle them, you can get angry 
And you could sell them. You are, you know, you're an idiot. You're stupid. I can't believe you believe that. Or you could lovingly tell them the truth. Okay? And it's amazing. It's amazing the effect that you could have with people. I've done this with people. I've done it with people who are cults and whatever come to my door and I treat them lovingly, tell them the truth, and it just makes a huge difference. And he's telling us that we should deal with them in love. Never, we never move from the truth. Okay, you don't compromise the truth, but you do this in love. The goal for every believer to become, is to become more like Christ. And as the church matures and individual members should just keep, you know, showing this Christ-likeness, we encourage each other. Well, very quickly, the growth impacts both the personal holiness and our relationships with the body. Because verse 16 says, from him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. And so the last one I want to share is it's a shared responsibility and cooperation. It's shared. As members of one body, and we're also part of a local body, we belong to each other. We affect each other. We need each other. Um, and let me just say again, no matter how insignificant you might think, <laughs> you are vitally important. The body grows as the individual members grow and um, as we feed on the word. Um, and so the last thing I just want to say, and this is just a, in closing because I'm way over because of all we did today, but number five, decide to use your gifts to serve others. Just decide to use your gifts to serve others. You say, I, I might not, and I could give you some tips later on, you know, part, part of the way you say, oh, how do I discover that? Do stuff. Try stuff. Serve in different ways. That's one of the easiest ways. You can study them and kind of do, do an assessment. There's online assessments and all that. And those are great tools. It's not Bible, but it's great tools. But sometimes you'll do something and you'll go, whoa, I really, this is it. This, I remember the first time I preached. It was for a, um, a, a, like a dinner. Um, and it was like, wow, I think I'm supposed to do this. It just, I, mean, I was scared to death. But, and, and you ha I want you to do something you love. I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but something you love, that you love doing. I, Ray Steadman was a longtime pastor of Peninsula Bible Church in Palo Alto. He's passed away a long time ago now, but um, I, came, I was reading one of his books, and, I, I, and he said this about spiritual gifts. He said, each one of us is gifted. It doesn't matter whether we are old, young, rich, poor, talented, awkward, articulate, quiet, handsome, plain, popular, unknown. You have a spiritual gift. If you do not have a spiritual gift, you are not a Christian. If you know and exercise your gift, you contribute to the vitality and ministry of the church. If not, you rob the church of a measure of the impact and influence God intended his church to have on the world. So it is crucially important that you understand, recognize, and exercise your gift. Oh, that was so powerful. Think, if you have the gift of mercy, just think of the people who need that gift. And if they don't get it, no mercy, right? Those of you who don't have the gift of mercy, don't do hospital calls. You know, you walk in, really? You're sick again? <laughs> you know, that, see, uh, <laughs> we all have our gifts. <laughs> As a pastor, you guys might, might not see this, but there's a lot of people, you go to conferences or whatever, read books, whatever. People try to approach the church like a corporation, gets like a business, like an organization. I, I understand it needs to be organized, but, but it's a living body. You know, it's made up of cells, and those cells are us. You know, this living cells, our individual believers, I guess we could say. And we all have that unique role to play. A healthy church is when everyone is, has a role. And it's not just the pastors and the leaders, but each believer contributes to that healthy body. And, and if it gets out of whack, then, then cells die, you know. And if it's overly, you know, it's, if it's obnoxious, it becomes a cancer. You know, cells can do crazy things. But working together, it's such a wonderful thing. When everyone serves according to their gifts and calling, the church thrives and fulfills its purpose. So, as we close, I just want to say, what do you, what do you love to do? You say, well, I love to bake, you know. Well, that can help a church grow, <laughs> I'm just saying. You say, but, you say, but I've got this that I'm just really impassioned about it. Look at the get lists of the gifts uh, and, and say, 
this might be the gift of encouragement because I really, I love to bake, but I really love to bake for other people and be an encouragement to people. You see, there's things that you can do that are part of that. Now, I know I might be talking to people here or online that don't know that they're a part of the body of Christ. The whole analogy is like, well, I don't really know. You talk about serving and being a part, but I don't know that for certain. And so I want to just give us time. I want those of you who are Christ followers just to, just to take a moment to pray and just say, God, what do I love to do? How have you gifted me? He doesn't want to keep this a secret. This isn't some kind of mystery you're supposed to try to figure out. He wants you to know what your gift is. But if you don't know Christ, I, I want to... I want to just help you and lead you in a prayer that will help you to accept him. Uh, accepting Christ is a step of faith. Christ did the work by dying, being buried, and rising again. He offers it as a free gift. We receive it as a free gift. A wonderful way to do that and to express that is just by praying. And that's what I'm going to lead us to do. This isn't a magic prayer. This is just a prayer similar to what I prayed when I, when I accepted Christ. So um, feel free to follow us along. And I'm going to display it here. So those of you who are praying, if you're praying it here, Feel free just to keep your eyes open, pray as we pray this. You might just pray something like this. You can use your own words, but you could pray. Heavenly Father, today I come to you realizing that I've been walking my own way. Today I want to give you my life and walk with you. I admit that I am a sinner and nothing I do can earn a place in your family. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die, be buried, and rise again for me so that I can have eternal life. I receive your forgiveness and payment for my sin. I ask you to be my savior. Thank you for saving me and accepting me into your family. Help me to serve you with the gifts that you give me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be a part of your church, the body of Christ, your family. We don't deserve it. We haven't done anything to earn it. We're so grateful that you've called us into your family and you allow us to be a part. We're so thrilled, Father, that we have been given gifts by you and we pray that we would use them wisely. Help us to be good stewards. I pray, Lord, that you would be with those who are receiving your gift of salvation for the very first time today that, are, that just prayed that prayer. I pray that the Holy Spirit would speak to them and comfort them, bring them that assurance. And I ask, Lord, that you would help them to walk with you each day. Thank you so much for our time to worship you. Thank you for this beautiful morning and for the, your word that gives us strength. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much again for joining me today. And I want to let you know a couple of things. First, I am here for you. I want to be of help to you and encouragement to you. Those of you who are part of the Hillside family um, and you'd like to talk or you'd like to, you know, if you want to message back and forth, you can, you can uh, email me, you can Facebook message me. Um, let me know if you want me to give you a call. I'd be happy to do that and talk. I know some of you may have questions, you know, as to, you know, hey, why, why are you leaving or whatever? Um, I'd be happy to answer any of those questions. And just to let you know, right off the bat, there's no scandal, there's no difficulty, there's no problems. Um, I'm not leaving from Hillside, I'm really leaving for Hillside. I want to see Hillside do great things and I am really excited to see what God has. So, hey, if there's any way I can be of help to you, if I can pray for you, let me know. A great way of letting us know about prayer requests is to go to hillside.church and on the pull down menu, there's a place for prayer requests. There's also a place for comments, uh, a place for you know questions that you can ask. We'll be glad to help you with any of those. And so we're here for you. But thank you so much again for joining me today. And I'll look forward to connecting with you again next week. Take care and God bless.